greetings to all of you in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ it's a matter of great joy for me to be with you all once again and share from god's word the bible we are looking at a small book called philippians philippians is a four chapter small book in the new testament written by apostle paul to his beloved believers in a place called philippi that is a roman colony and we are looking at was 27 of chapter 1 for the past few weeks i would like to to add upon those truths which i have already shared we are looking at lives worthy of the gospel of jesus christ let me read that verse once again philippians chapter 1 verse 27 onwards only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of christ so that whether i come and see you or remain absent i will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel in no way alarmed by your opponents which is a sign of destruction for them but of salvation for you and that too from god for to you it is been granted for christ sake not only to believe in him but also to suffer for his sake experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me in our past time together during the last few weeks we were looking at this particular verse and philippians as we have already learned we have learned that this thesis was the only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of christ after apostle paul celebrates the fellowship that he shares with the philippians in christ and the ministry of the gospel of christ thanking them and for the their ministry to him and after providing a ministry report of sorts informing them of his circumstances as he is under house arrest at rome and waiting for his trial before nero he comes to finally address the philippians themselves and this command to literally carry out their duties as citizens worthy of the gospel of christ the first commandment in the epistle till verse 27 we are not able to come across any commandment from paul but here we read that we need to carry out ourselves as worthy citizens of the gospel of jesus christ it is a sort of introduction to the rest of the letter all of his commandments all of his admonitions are simply the exposition of this command to let their manner of life be worthy of the gospel of christ paul's chief aim and concern in writing to the philippians is not only to thank them for their gift to him and to inform them of how things are going with him but also to see to it that they are bringing the gospel to bear upon every aspect of their life the gospel of jesus christ is going to affect the life in every facet of a person if you are trusting the lord jesus christ paul desires that when they face the issues of daily life whether that be how to interact with one another in their relationship or how to carry out the ministry of the gospel in their city how to minister to one another and alongside one another how to deal with the persecution how to deal with the false teaching how to deal with temptation how to deal with suffering how to deal with trials in all those issues paul's concern is that all these people who are listening to this word of god be able to take the truths that they have come to understand and experience as a result of the gospel of jesus christ as a result of being saved and renewed by his sovereign grace and to apply those realities to their lives apply the realities of salvation to every facet of our life he means for the reality of being redeemed by the blood of christ 
being reconciled to the Father, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit to have an effect on how they make decisions and navigate life together. And so, we observed through last few sessions the supreme importance of that commandment signified by the word only. There is no other way a child of God can conduct himself or herself. Whatever else you do, Paul tells the Philippians, when I come to you or remain absent, don't miss this. Let this be your concern. Let this be your priority to conduct yourself worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we also saw the distinctive imagery explaining that it is literally translated, conduct yourself as citizens of heaven. And that this imagery would have been very vivid to Philippians because they prized their Roman citizenship so much. We observed further that the rule of heavenly citizenship is the gospel itself. That if we desire to order our lives aright as faithful citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we do not look to new laws or new lists or man-made habits and manufactured pattern of behavior. No, we look to the gospel itself. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ through his word. And when we allow God's word to, to influence our life, our conduct will automatically change. The Lord himself through the power of the Holy Spirit will change our conduct, change our behavior, change our mindset, change our attitude. And that is what will help us in our pursuit of holiness. And then I sought to model to you how a faithful follower of Christ would bring the gospel to bear on 12 particular Christian virtues. 12 specific ways in which gospel shapes and gospel molds the pursuit of holiness in our day-to-day -day life. And I, I was intentionally broad going beyond the scope of what Paul had in mind in this particular passage and expanding to the breadth of the, new, the entire New Testament because this commandment to walk worthy of the gospel is really a summary statement of the entire Christian life. But, you know, when Paul wrote to Philippians, he had in mind very particular applications of this command, applications specifically suited to their present situation. And this morning, we are going to examine three of those particular applications which can be applied in the life of Philippines as well as in our life. You could call them three indications of a life worthy of the gospel. You look into your own life whether your life is lived in a manner worthy of the gospel. Three indications or three marks of one conducting himself as a faithful citizen of heaven. And though they come in a form that is very su suited and tailored to the specific challenges of the Philippines, the problems which they were facing, the application of this command to live worthy of the gospel have every bit of relevance and application to us in our own very day, 2000 odd years later. These are not only what Paul expects of his dear friends in the first century Philippi, but they are what God expects of his children in every age. And studying them will help us to know what the gospel driven life looks like even today. So, I would like to make a preliminary remark. The consistency of our spiritual life. But before Paul starts in on his application, he inserts a small comment that I want to address briefly. It would have been quite natural for him to say, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and then to write on, move right on to standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together and so on. But before he begins explaining to the Philippians what it will look like for them to live as citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel, he says, So that whether 
I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing for. So, there is a call to consistency which God through his servant is calling each and every one of us. I will read it again. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing for. He says things like this elsewhere in his letter. Chapter 2 verse 12. So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What's his point here? What is that he is trying to communicate? Well, we have mentioned before, the kind of strong bond and strong loving affection that existed between Paul and Philippians. Philippians loved their dear apostle, the one who first spoke the gospel to them, one who introduced the love of Jesus Christ in their life and assured them or helped them to get into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was their spiritual father. Paul is the one who helped them to come to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is the one who laid the foundation for their Christian life. And so they loved him and revered him. And besides this, Paul had God given authority in the church as an apostle of Christ. They would look to him to answer particular questions and solve disputes as one who speaks for the Lord himself. So, Paul was the spokesman for Jesus Christ. And so it's easy to imagine that when Paul was around, it is very natural for the Philippines to be on their best behavior, so to speak. And not just because they were hypocrites who wanted Paul's approval, but because when he was around, he reminded them of their commitment to Christ and what it meant to live worthy of the gospel. But now, Paul has been absent for nearly two years and though he is reasonably certain that he will come to them again, he, was no, he has no infallible word from God that he is so sure that he will get back to Philippi. But as we have learned last week from that word only at the beginning of verse 27 of chapter 1 of Philippians, his chief concern is that whether Paul comes or whether he remains absent, whatever happens to him, the Philippines need only be concerned with living lives that are worthy of the gospel. What he is saying here, your gospel driven lives cannot depend upon my presence. Our gospel driven life should not be lived for any leader. It should not be lived for any priest. It should not be lived to put up a show in front of anybody. Our accountability to live a gospel driven life is not to be to human being, but to our God who is our savior and creator and our redeemer and our sustainer and our provider. A life worthy of the gospel is not lived in the fear of Paul or anybody else. A life worthy of the gospel is lived in the fear of God. And what I meant, uh, what I want from you, Philippians, is for you to conduct yourself as citizens worthy of the gospel, whether I come and see it for myself or whether I can only hear of it by report. Your gospel driven lives must be marked by consistency. Consistency in our commitment to our God. Consistency in our commitment to his word that God expect out of our life. And there's the key word, consistency. Paul wants them to bring the gospel to bear on every facet of their life, every aspect of their life, their corporate life as church, their, corp their family life, their individual life, their life as husband and wife, their life as parents and children, in every facet of life, the gospel should bear some fruit. No, he longs for them to live lives of consistent obedience in the fear of God who never leaves them, 
who never forsakes them and we can benefit from this lesson dear friends as you spend your leisure time the way you do as you watch the movies or tv shows that you do as you discuss the conversation topics that you discuss as you speak to your spouse the way you do as you interact with your family the way you interact with them the question the holy spirit is asking us through his word is would you act the same way if your spiritual father were with you would you speak the way you speak if any of your spiritual mentor or your spiritual elder is with you would you spend the time the way you spend if another of your elder were along with you if so your life your spiritual life is one of inconsistency your spiritual life is inconsistent at the same time it is hypocritical you want to put up a show of godliness you want to show the form of godliness and denying its power that should not happen in the life of any child of god you live in the light of god's fear you live in the light of god's presence god's word so clearly says that you have kept my sins my secret sins in the light of your countenance nothing nothing is hidden for god everything is plain and open before god whatever we are doing in privacy god knows it and bible talks about secret sin in psalm 90 and from that particular verse we can understand i and i always say to myself and to all the dear ones secret sins are not as secret as you think we may think that it is a secret sin we may think that my children doesn't know my wife doesn't know my church members do, do not know my boss doesn't know you may think that it is secret but in the light of god's word i will tell you secret sins are no not secret as you think secret sins are not as safe as you think secret sins are not as safe as you think many a times when we do certain things we think that we are safe because we it is secret nobody knows about it but god knows it and one more point secret sins are not as satisfying as you think holiness will satisfy you living a godly life will satisfy you it is profitable and it is gain for you but secret sin will ruin you it will ruin your conscience and a, a, it is more damaging to your soul than public sin because public sin there is a chance for other people to come and rebuke you but whereas a secret sin will allow you to live as a hypocrite before the people where you fear people more than god because when you are in secret when you are in closed room in your own room what you are doing you are doing right in front of god and you don't fear that god but you fear people you fear your parents or you fear your spouse more than god that is nothing but practical atheism we should not live like that and one of the servant of god told like this god will never allow his own children to sin successfully he will never allow his children to sin successfully you may think that okay i have managed to sin and nobody knows about it that has happened in the life of david he sinned by committing adultery with bethsheba he covered it by murdering her husband he he covered up everything and then he must have thought okay now i am safe now nobody knows except maybe joab my my warrior but i'll tell you one verse is there in the bible regarding what david has done it displeased the lord what david has done if your life is displeasing to god of the universe i will tell you you have to count the cost you will you will have to face the music so live in fear of god and live your life your spiritual life with consistency 
Consistency means you are living for God. You are conducting yourself for God. You are speech. You see God as the unseen hearer of every conversation which you make. The thoughts of your heart. The meditation of your heart. What is going on in your mind. The, the, the lust which you have. The lust of eyes. The pride of life. Everything is plain and open before God to whom we must give account. So I urge you, as Paul was urging the Philippians, whether I am there or not, as a servant of God, whether I am there or not, you conduct yourself worthy of the gospel of Christ because Christ is the most important person for you. He is the one who saved you. He is the one who redeemed you. He is the one who paid the ransom for your sin. So you honor him and you live for him. And we got that message from God's word. As we see TV, as we browse through internet, whether we are able to go to, to, to evil sites, are we going into pornography? Are we going into do dirty things of this world thinking that nobody knows? As I told, secret sins are not as secret as you think. Secret sins are not as safe as you think. Secret sins are not as satisfying as you think. Turn to God in repentance. Ask for his forgiveness. Confess your sins before him. He is faithful and just to forgive you all your sins. Confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and you shall be saved. God's word says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Do you want this salvation? If you are not saved, if you are not consistent in your spiritual life, I urge you to come under the submission of God's word. And Paul's point is that Lord Jesus Christ is with you. Jesus Christ promised, Lo, I am with you to the end of ages. Jesus Christ is with you. He does see you. He does hear you. We all live our entire life before the open face of God. We live our entire life before the open face of God and our desire to please Him should be all the accountability. We need to live lives that are consistently worthy of the gospel of Christ. So all the application which we have learned about loving God. God should approve that. My love for others, I can put forth a show that I am loving. But deep down in my heart, if I am grudging against one another, if I am having self-motivation uh, uh, and uh, selfishness and jealousy towards other people, God knows it. My generosity, my joy, my humility, all those things should be approved by God himself. My role as a husband, my role as a father, my role as a wife or a, a child, my role as an employer or as an employee, my God is watching me. So, may the Lord minister to your heart and bring your life in subjection to God's word so that you will consistently live worthy of the gospel of Christ. To that end, may the spirit of the Lord move in your heart May the Spirit of the Lord lead you and guide you. Let us close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we want to live for your glory. You are the one who created us. You are the one who, who laid your life to save us. We want to thank you for the precious salvation which you have offered to us. We thank you for the justification and glorification which is there for us. We thank you for the sanctifying work of the Spirit of God and the sanctifying word of God which you use in our life. In the days to come, enable all these dear ones who are listening to this message be blessed by you by their intimate, affectionate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and to your word so that it will light their path all the way to eternity so that their life will be lived with a contentment which is beyond human understanding and remove all the anxious thoughts from their heart and enable them to lead a life of godliness worthy of the gospel of Christ. In Jesus Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen.